We've had four lectures so far, and we've taken a pretty straight-line approach through the main part of the theory. But as we've done that, we've ignored some little side questions which really need to be resolved. So this lecture is basically going to be in a question-and-answer format, and I have Kram Nozlu here to ask some questions on your behalf. Yeah, so can we really add integers in a constant amount of time? What if they're huge? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. So, actually, the addition of integers is not always an elementary operation. Think about the representation of integers in a machine. Typically, we have a machine word, which is something like, say, 64 bits. And 2 to the 63 minus 1 is the largest integer that can be represented with that. The reason it's not 2 to the 64 is that we also want the negatives of those numbers. That number there is quite large, say 10 to the 20. And if we have integers much smaller than that, we can add them. And if the sum is still smaller than that, we don't get any overflow. And we can do everything using very quick bitwise operations. And that is a constant time operation. So normal size integers are OK. But really big integers are a problem. If I have an integer that's this big, could easily happen if I'm calculating the few thousandth Fibonacci number. Get very large numbers. How do I represent those? If we want all the digits, we're actually going to have to write it all out. And really, it has to be represented as a string. Then I might have another number, which is a similarly long string. If you think about how Fibonacci algorithm was working, it was adding two numbers as it went along. It would then have to add these two as strings rather than as integers. So it would have a rule saying, well, you first add these, then you carry that one, and you add that. And it, would, it would basically execute some kind of algorithm like primary school addition. But notice, if these are, say, n bits long, it's going to take of the order of n operations here. So adding two integers, which take n bits to represent, is going to take order n time. So it's a linear time operation, not a constant time operation. That actually means that the entire Fibonacci fast fib algorithm we looked at, instead of running in linear time, when you work it all out, it turns out, because it's adding successively larger and larger numbers, it turns out that it actually runs in, in quadratic time in n. In certain applications, you often run in to huge integers which are too big to fit in a machine word. And then the analysis of your algorithms needs to be modified. Mostly in these lectures, we're going to be considering data types where we can do things like addition in a constant time. But you do need to be aware of these applications. Now I remember something about how we can represent integers more efficiently when we use binary arithmetic. Seems like the size measure you're using is a bit big. That's another excellent question and a very important one, even for the examples we've already seen. So if you think about representing integers in binary, you have 0, 1, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. We know that we don't need n bits to represent the number n. In fact, we need a much smaller number. We add in a few more here. So with 3 bits, we can get up to 1 plus 2 plus 4, which is 7. If you have m bits, then all numbers less than 2 to the m minus 1 can be represented with a smaller number of bits, but that number requires m bits. So that's the smallest number for which we need m bits. So the number n, whose representation requires n bits, it's got to be at least that big. On the other hand, when we get to about twice as big as that, 2 to the m, we're going to need to go one bit higher. So the set of numbers which are representable by n bits satisfy this pair of inequalities. And then if we take the binary log,
and 2 to the m minus 1 is less than 2 to the m. So we have that inequality there. Log n is not an integer in general, but if we take the floor, which is the largest integer less than or equal to it, we must have this. And so this actually is the floor, this is now an integer, this m minus 1 is the floor of log n. So m is equal to 1 plus the floor of log n, just to be precise. The key point though is that m is about log n, binary log of n. If we want to measure the size of an integer n, some number around log n is much better measure of size than n itself. Now that has some major consequences for what we've been doing already. Remember the linear time algorithm fast fib we had for calculating the nth Fibonacci number? It ran in about n elementary operations. Let's say it's some constant times n. It doesn't actually matter. Around n. But n is not the input size. m is around log n. Right? So n is about 2 to the m, as we see here. It's between like half of 2 to the m and 2 to the m. Now, n is not the input size. m is the input size. So really, if we do this properly, we should say the running time as a function, let's say, of the input size m, it's still about c times n, but n is like 2 to the m. So it's looking like that. Okay, so that has actually converted, because we changed our variable from n to m, this actually shows that we have what we, an exponential time algorithm. So it doesn't make sense to talk about a linear time algorithm or a quadratic time algorithm or an exponential time algorithm without specifying how you're measuring the input size. And when you make a change, as we've done here, it can change the answer. This measure of input size seems much more reasonable to me than the n we were doing before. So what do you mean by the running time on an input of size n? What if there's lots of different inputs? Well, you get another excellent question. It is true that we've been looking so far at algorithms where we're basically taking some integer n as an input, for example. When we were looking at Fibonacci numbers, it was pretty obvious that there was one in input of size n, that namely n itself. We, we just discussed the fact that maybe that's a bad way of measuring the input size. If we use the number of bits, then of course there are a large number of inputs of the same size. And so we have to confront this problem. Similarly, when we do sorting, the running time of a sorting algorithm often depends on the particular input that you get, and there are a large number of those. If you have n items, there's usually n factorial ways in which they could be presented to you to start with. So the problem can be that running time could be some amount on one particular nice input, but much more on a nasty one. How are we going to measure this? So the basic answers are that we're going to look at the, some statistics. So we have a distribution of all possible inputs of size n, could be a lot of them. Each of them has its own running time, and it's too many numbers to, for us to think about. So we will look at some basic statistics. We'll look at the worst case. That's the maximum of, let's say, t of i over all inputs whose size is equal to n, and maybe we call that w of n. We're not going to use this notation much, but we're defining the maximum running time over all inputs of a given size. Or it could be the average case, where we might look at the expected value of the running time. We could also consider the best case, although that's not usually very helpful. And then we would have the minimum instead of the maximum. So that's basically what we're going to do when we've got a lot of inputs. 
we will just summarize by some kind of statistic. So what's the deal with worst case and average case analysis? Which one's better? It is true that worst and average case are two very different ways of thinking about an algorithm. And we need to really think about both of them. Let's start with the worst case. One reason why worst case analysis is really good is that the mathematics involved is simpler, usually. Usually finding the maximum, the worst possible running time for a given size is a lot easier than finding the average. You can often guess what the worst case input's going to look like. For some kind of sorting algorithms, for example, uh, you can guess straight away. And then you just have to calculate the running time for that one input, and there you're done. Another really important case is that it is the worst case. So if you're risk averse, if you have a mission critical application, for example, airplane, nuclear submarine, nuclear power station, something like that, which must perform various operations in a guaranteed amount of time, otherwise something horrible happens, then worst case is definitely what you want to be looking at. So those are two good things about the worst case. On the other hand, it's very conservative. Often we don't get anywhere near the worst case running time in practice. If I want to compare two algorithms for the same problem, and algorithm A has a worst case which is better than B, but both of them are massively far off what you will actually achieve in practice, and in fact B is much better than A on typical data, then which one are you going to do? It depends. If you're not very risk averse, you can take a few risks, occasional long wait time, and you probably go for algorithm B, which has a better average case. This is exactly the situation with something like heap sort and quick sort. Quick sort is called quick because it's quick in practice. In theory, of course, it isn't, and its worst case is quite bad. Why don't you care about the constants? And once again, an excellent question. Well, let's consider this kind of example. Suppose that the running time of your algorithm is a n plus b. So it's a linear time algorithm, some constants a and b. Now, if n is very large, then t of n is going to be very close to a times n. It doesn't really matter what a and b are. If n is big enough, a n is going to be much bigger than b. Now, if I then want to look at what happens if I double the input size and see how the algorithm running time scales, it's going to look like 2 times a times n. Okay, But the point is it's doubled. Double the input, double the output. If you had something that looked like, I don't know, c times n squared, and then you double it, you've got four times the running time you had before. And again, it's irrelevant what the constants are. We don't care what a was. All we know is that it doubled. That's the scaling factor. Here, it quadrupled when we doubled the input size and we don't really need to know the value of c. So in this case, one constant was not that relevant because of the size considerations, and the other one was not that relevant because we're only really interested in asymptotic behavior as we scale. So that's a reason why we're not really interested in constants a lot of the time. We often don't care about what a, b, and c are. Suppose we have a linear function here and a quadratic function here, we're trying to compare them. For sufficiently large n, we know that this one is going to be much bigger than this. It doesn't matter what the values of a, b, and c are. Okay. So those are several reasons why we can forget about constants most of the time. In the end, we're mostly going to be interested in does the running time scale like n, n log n, n squared, n cubed, something like that. Finer distinctions are not necessary for a lot of applications. That sounds a bit slick. Are you sure that we can always ignore the constants? Yes, very good question. So as we know from the last question, we can often ignore constants, but it is true that we can't always ignore them. For example, if you have two algorithms which are both good, in other words, you've picked all the low-hanging fruit, you've 
thrown away the obviously rubbishy algorithms. You've got two that are both good, and you want to know which one to use. It might be that one is constant times n running time, and the other is another constant times n, and you need to know what the constant is in order to know which one to pick. Of course, in practice, you would also probably implement it and do some actual timing as well as the theoretical analysis that we're doing here. For example, if you want to choose between merge sort and heap sort, both of which have the same asymptotic running time, then we might need to consider constant factors. Also, many really important algorithms are used in libraries. They're used over and over again. And if you can shave a factor of two off the running time, asymptotically it doesn't make any difference. But why not? You're saving a massive amount of people's time over many decades, possibly. So really important algorithms, it's important to think about the constants as well. Of course, if you're only going to use it once, then maybe you wouldn't worry that much. Another reason you can't always ignore constants is that sometimes they can be of wildly different sizes. So there are some strange algorithms that sometimes have odd constants. For example, you could have an algorithm whose running time looks like that. Tiny constant times n squared. And another one, which is a large constant times n. Now we've been saying that we should probably prefer this one. Well, that's true, except if this was the actual running time, and these were the actual constants. The problem is that in order for the linear algorithm to outperform the quadratic one in terms of having a shorter running time, you solve this inequality, you actually get that n is at least 10 to the 20. It's a good exercise to do. And 10 to the 20 is a massive input size, probably, for most problems. It may be that you never get something that big in practice. So a conclusion here is that you do need to consider constants at least roughly. You need to have a rough idea about whether they are sort of normal, reasonable sized constants or whether there could be something weird going on. Typically very large or very small constants come from quite complicated algorithms and you'll probably have some kind of a hint that something is going on. But it's important just to remember that the asymptotic analysis that we're talking about here is not the entire story actual values of constants for moderate size values of n can matter. So I just want to finish off by saying what is our goal now after the first five lectures? Typically now what we want to do is we have a particular problem and a particular algorithm for it. We want to find some function f, some nice simple function like n, n squared, n log n if we can that kind of thing. And we want to show that the running time, by the average or worst case, depending on what we're doing, is of exact order f of n time. We want to understand the exact growth rate of the algorithm's running time. That way we can at least have a chance of comparing algorithms and throwing away obviously suboptimal ones. Remember, there's a huge difference between n and n squared asymptotically. Big difference between n log n and n squared. The difference between, say, n and n log n is substantial, but it's not nearly as big. And obviously, n cubed, 2 to the n, these things are ridiculously much larger than the things we've just mentioned. For the kind of problems we'll be dealing with in the rest of the course, we're typically going to have running times that are of order n, n log n, n squared, maybe n cubed because we'll be presenting algorithms which are, quote, fast. There are many problems where there don't appear to be any fast algorithms, and the best we can do is exponential time. But we won't be presenting those. We're going to be looking at well-known and important fast algorithms for classic computing problems.